Hi, my name is Christopher Viscopoulos of Medical Specialist Associates, and this topic is upon using the ROX index to assess whether or not high flow nasal cannula is working or not, and if the patient then requires intubation. This is an extremely important topic considering the current COVID pandemic. Thanks for watching, and thanks for learning with us. Medical Specialists Associates, making medical education more accessible. So let's here begin to jump right into it. So this topic is on the ROX index. Now, some of you might not be familiar with the ROX index. It's something that was published in 2019 by ROCA, and it is a quantitative metric to assess whether or not high flow nasal cannula is successful or if it is currently failing and the patient requires intubation. As Many of you might recall during this particular COVID uh, pandemic, and we will review some of the literature, BiPAP is currently not recommended in this patient population. It's not recommended because of something that is termed SILI, S-I-L-I, which stands for self-induced lung injury. Simply, if you see someone on BiPAP with COVID-19 and you walk past their room and you look at the variation in tidal volumes, these patients could be getting tremendous tidal volume, sometimes 11, 12, maybe 15, 1600 cc tidal volumes. And it's that stretch injury that's concerning for us and possibly is leading to all of the pneumothoraces and pneumomediastitums that we can see uh, in these patients, basically some type of lung damage. And hence, high flow nasal cannula has really been the go-to. However, since we're using more high flow nasal cannula than we have ever before, and probably more importantly, we're seeing more patients than ever before. There has to be a way for us to instruct our colleagues, our respiratory therapists, how and when to notify us if they believe that a patient is not doing well in high flow nasal cannula and requires our attention. So to this end, let's begin to jump straight into it. But before I do here, just a very quick overview to make sure that we're on the same page. And recall that in this uh, COVID-19 entity, we see a median day of onset of symptoms of about five days from when you're exposed. And then amazingly enough, almost without failure, somewhere between this like eight and 10 day range is where we see individuals progress into respiratory failure. And it's right here at this particular interval that patients are likely on high flow nasal cannula and require possibly our attention if their ROX index score is low. So I also just wanted to briefly address a misconception about high flow nasal cannula if your institutions aren't doing it, um, or at least not doing it to the extent that they should. And that is based upon the risk of aerosolization and your staff being exposed to the coronavirus. There seems to be this misperception, perhaps maybe because the mouth is open and people believe that you can just simply breathe out as much as you want and you could see the room with coronavirus, that there could be more exposure to our staff. But that's simply not true. And when we review a little more in detail upon how high flow nasal cannula works, you'll see that the air is coming in so fast that it's entraining in the back of the throat and in essence, preventing the patient from breathing out. And so you'll see here that actually BiPAP, nebulization, simple face mask, venturi mask, nasal cannula, all have much, much higher exposure into the room than high flow nasal cannula. So this is something important maybe that you should educate your staff on during rounds just to make them feel more reassured. So I do want to just touch base a little bit in detail here about exactly how high flow nasal cannula works. So the first point is here about heated and humidification to body temperature. So this is very important. During the initiation of the COVID pandemic, prior to us knowing really anything about the entity, there were many patients that were on BiPAP, and these individuals were on BiPAP maybe for five, six, seven days, something longer than the standard indications for BiPAP, which are really COPD disease and acute on chronic congestive heart failure. 
And what we began to notice was really ulceration in the mouth, dryness of the mouth, maybe even extending down to the vocal cords and into the trachea. Now, that is because BiPAP really can't be humidified very well, especially as compared to high-flow nasal cannula. High-flow nasal cannula can really be fully humidified and therefore is much more comfortable for the patient. So when we're encountering these patients that are going to go into respiratory failure, maybe for days to weeks at a time, high-flow nasal cannula really is a modality that we can safely use. Again, for a reason of humidification, which is really important. Coming back to our slide here, you get really maximum flow rates with high-flow nasal cannula between 40 and 80 liters per minute, and that depends on the machine you're using. Now, this is important to note because when someone is in respiratory failure, they usually have a very quick inspiratory uh, breathing rate. They're just trying to get that air in, and it just so happens that the high inspiratory flow rates um, of between the 40 and 80 that you get with uh, high-flow nasal cannula match very well with what the usual patient has and requires during their respiratory failure. They're usually breathing in around 40 to 60 liters, and this matching can make the high-flow nasal cannula very comfortable for the patient. So our next point here is that it flushes the nasal pharynx during exhalation so that the first bolus of air during inspiration is not just expired air, but is partly refreshed by the oxygenated high-flow nasal cannula gas. And again, if we recall our prior slide, this is important because this is one of the mechanisms to where we're not really getting a lot of seating in the room. You're getting a lot of the entrainment of the air in the back of the throat, preventing it from being breathed out. Another important point here is that since, again, we will be using this device for long periods of time, it's soft and loosely fitting device that does not impede with speech or eating use. So this, again, is a very important point. What we have noticed in our COVID-19 patients is that we could be caring for them for a very long time. Some uh, information presented recently at the European Society of Critical Care Medicine in 2020 showed that a lot of these patients, even if they have a tremendous amount of what appears to be lung damage on chest X-ray and CT scan, will recover at 12 weeks in terms of their pulmonary function and their chest X-rays and CT scans will begin to look normal. However, the important point to note there is that that was at 12 weeks and possibly maybe even a little bit longer and so you could see that in our management strategy of these COVID-19 patients, we need to come to a management strategy that we look towards the long term. And this is going to be things concentrating such on mobility to decrease deconditioning, as well as to make sure that they can eat and they have good nutrition. And of course, the best nutrition is going to be orally, whether that's the patient eating themselves or with, uh, say, nasogastric tube feedings or maybe peg tube feedings if they have a peg tube. However, such feedings are contraindicated in BiPAP. However, with high-flow nasal cannula, they can be much safer. Now, there is maybe some particular controversy uh, with using high-flow nasal cannula um, and feeding, but uh, especially in this particular context, let's say, to where you have a patient that is going to be on high-flow nasal cannula for weeks at a time, and you really need to look at that longer horizon you really have no choice but to uh, attempt oral gastric feeding um, with these patients. And high-flow nasal cannula then is really the way to go. So it's going to decrease the respiratory rate by, again, flushing of the nasal pharynx. It also washes out anatomic dead space. And what this does is improve ventilator, uh, ventilatory efficiency. And it also has a slowing of exhalation um, by the inflowing gases. And this last point is important here. Because what you roughly get is a peep here. You get an, what we're going to call here an expiratory pedance, but maybe impedance, but think of it as a peep. You get roughly one centimeter of water per every 10 liters of flow with the high-flow nasal cannula. And this has been shown to increase end expiratory lung volume. Again, because that, that is our peep. And so what you will see is, is with our patients, if they are possibly maybe obese, which a lot of our COVID-19 patients are. They might have some more of the adiposity around the abdomen, and this could have the tendency of coming up onto the lungs and closing down the lungs. The high-flow nasal cannula can really be wonderful. Again, if it's ran at, say, 80 liters of flow, which is what the highest machines can run, you can get the equivalent of about eight of PEEP, which can be really important for these patients to maintain their lungs being open. 
Moving on here, let's just briefly compare the difference here between high flow nasal cannula and uh, BiPAP here, uh, non-invasive ventilation. And really high flow nasal cannula is primarily a flow generator for the reasons that we just discussed. But here I just want to really drive home this point here that BiPAP really is a pressure targeted modality. And being a pressure to target modality, that's why it has success in its two main indications, which are COPD disease and acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. But again, because it is a pressure modality, we are concerned with lung damage in the COVID-19 patient to where you could be getting those erratic tidal volumes and stretch injury in the lungs. So very important to try to prevent this uh, in our patient population. So here on our next slide, before we talk about quantification of success of high flow nasal cannula, I really want to drive home the point that when you look at all of the major societies right now, they are preferentially uh, preferring high flow nasal cannula. So this is from the NIH COVID guideline reviews. And here in the red, we see that for adults with COVID-19 and acute respiratory uh, hypoxic failure, despite conventional oxygen therapy, the panel recommends high flow nasal cannula oxygen over non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. In addition to the NIH guidelines here, the US Department of Defense also has very similar guidelines here. They're a bit stronger and they say that BiPAP is contraindicated, which is what our practice is. And they really favor early intubation over non-invasive positive ven uh, ventilation uh, with BiPAP because there you can control the tidal volumes much better and again, prevent that lung injury. Here, the surviving uh, sepsis campaign guidelines, which actually were just updated and on this next, and um, in, uh, in the surviving sepsis guidelines being just updated, they also recommend um, the use of uh, high flow nasal cannula um, over BiPAP uh, as well. So now moving on to really what is the crux of this talk, which is the ROX index. And we're gonna spend some time here on this. So for those that might not be familiar with the ROX index, again, it was published in 2019 by Roca down here, and it really is a very simple formula. Your pulse ox divided by respiratory rate times the fraction of oxygen. And what you wanna do is upon initiation of um, the high flow nasal cannula, you're gonna look at intervals of two hours, six hours, and 12. And for our protocol that I'll share with you thereafter, every 12 hours thereafter, or PRN if the patient is having a change in respiratory status. And these are indices of failure, and they're excellent indices. Here we see that a ROC score of less than 3.85 is 100% predictive of failure at 12 hours for high flow nasal cannula. I'll mention a small caveat on this uh, in just a second. And here we notice that a ROC score above or equivalent to 4.88 at two, six, and 12 hours after high flow nasal cannula and thereafter is associated with a lower risk of intubation. It is important to note here that when this was done in 2019, of course, there was no COVID. And so what we are interested in is direct evidence that this uh, is also applicable to our COVID-19 patients. Now, of course, they have hypoxic respiratory failure, and we expect a very strong correlation, and this is a new entity. Well, of course, with COVID, it is a new entity, and many of us here have had to turn to pre-published information, pre-peer review, as it's going through the peer review process, because again, this field is just evolving so quickly. And so this is one such paper here from Temple here, where they looked at high flow nasal cannula patients where they were divided into two groups, the high flow nasal cannula only, and the high flow nasal cannula that progressed to the need for mechanical ventilation. And here their primary outcome was the ability of the ROCS index to predict the need of mechanical ventilation. And what they showed here is that of the 837 patients that they screened, 129 met inclusion criteria, and the mean age was uh, 60.8, which is consistent with the population that, uh, that we're seeing who are the most susceptible to COVID. 
And here also you he see that the patients uh, on average tend to have a higher BMI and at approximately a little more than 50% were female as well as a good minority representation for this study. And on the prior slide, I showed you that 4.88 number. Here they used a ROCKS index of five, so extremely close to the 4.88. And here they showed that any number less than this was predictive of the need for mechanical ventilation. In addition to this, they also showed here that any decrease in ROCKS index after high flow initiation, when you had a current number already, was also predictive of intubation. And why is this information so important? Well, this information is so important here because look, the mortality was only 11.2% in the high flow nasal cannula group as compared to 47.5% in the group that required mechanical ventilation. So it's yet just another reason why we need to be very knowledgeable and know exactly who will benefit from high flow nasal cannula, who will benefit those individuals who are currently failing high flow nasal cannula and we want to avoid stretch injury. So we put them on a very strict lung compliant and ventilator compliant regimen uh, with Argenet and otherwise, which we do show in other videos. So please reference those. And also those pa pa patients that could possibly be harmed by mechanical ventilation because they're doing okay on the high flow nasal cannula. And again, now we have a metric to use to judge whether or not they're doing okay. Well, of course, this information is so important. What we wanted to do was also share with you the protocol that we put out at our particular sites here. And here, and this is available on our website uh, for you to review. We review for the staff, the formula for the ROCKS index, we review the important predictors of success, particularly that score 4.88 at two, six, and 12 hours and every number thereafter. We also review with them the predictors for high flow nasal cannula failure at two, six, and 12 hours. And here we recommend that we get the ROCKS index score at the two, six, and 12 hours because we have these metrics above the follow. And then after that, we get the ROCKS index again every 12 hours uh, thereafter. And if any of these numbers here are below the reference numbers above, this automatically triggers an ICU consultation. In addition to this, in addition to getting the ROCK score every 12 hours, if there's a change in respiratory status concerning for the need of intubation, then again, of course, we get a ROCKS index there, and that also is an automatic consultation. So here it just reviews for the staff again that a score less than 3.85 is 100% predictive for respiratory failure at 12 hours, which is why we need a automatic ICU consultation. And also probably equally importantly that there really is a gap here in some of the scores between 3.85 and 4.88 at uh, 12 hours. And this really requires clinical judgment. So this also is an automatic ICU consultation for us to put together all of the uh, metrics that we're following on the patient to see whether or not they do require mechanical ventilation. Here's the reference for the, MOCA paper, uh, for the ROCA paper on our protocol. And last year, we also put in this nice diagram that came um, from the Europe, European paper here in the Intensive uh, Care uh, Medicine Journal here just in 2020. And they also just review a very similar algorithm to what's above basically again looking at that two, six, and 12 hour mark, and you can refer to this paper here if you wanted more information. Thank you so much for watching and learning with us today. If you're interested in taking this class for credit, or if you're interested in our other services, such as our direct clinical care services, please visit our website at www.med-specialist.net or click on the link in the description below. Also, make sure you subscribe to our channel to stay up to date on our most current content and educational opportunities.